Hey guys, just wanted to give you another update on this system. Not a huge difference from the last time, except that uh, I've almost got all the media in place. This is called Lika. That's one name for it anyway. And every time you say that, people are like, you know, they, they come up with different ways to spell it. Lika, L-E-C-A. Um, and I don't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's in an acronym. And basically what it is, is it's little clay marbles that are kind of puffed up and heated and they have air in them. And these things actually will float just barely. If they get waterlogged enough, they'll slowly sink. They're incredibly lightweight, which means when you're using them in an ebb and flow system, when the water comes into this system, which again, for maybe those that haven't seen other videos about me, there's a pump in that big pipe. Actually, that's the exhaust. There's a pump in the little pipe, right? So a pump is attached to that little pipe. It pumps water in and it comes in there. And if you look down at the bottom, you see it's, 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 it's flowed right now. It's not full. And that bottom bulkhead all the way at the bottom, that's where the water comes in. And this top guy right here, that overflows. Now that fitting right there, that's a one quarter to one inch adapter fitting. You don't need that. I felt like my stand-ups were a little short. It was just easier to throw one of those on them than to replace the whole pipe. And that also lets me, if I decide I want a lower system once the roots are in, I can just pop that off. I can even leave it right here, you know, in the system. So it's there whenever I do new plants. When you're doing new plants, you want to bring your water level higher. So anyway, that's what's going on there. And every time that water flows in, these actually kind of rise up a little bit, even when they're stacked deep like they are now. And that lets a lot of air in. And when that, when that water goes back out, they kind of fall back down. It pulls a lot of oxygen into your roots. And since I switched to using these over lava rock, everything is better. The plants grow better. My life is better. And it's easier. It's also expensive. This stuff is expensive. And I'm short about one big bag of it over here. You can see that um, this one's not quite filled up to the level these are. But that gives me an opportunity to show you that underneath here is lava rock, because lava rock's a lot cheaper. So what I do is I put about 50, whatever my height is gonna be in a system, assuming it's a deep enough system for this to pertain to it. If it's a shallow system, I'll just go with all this. Um, I'll put lava rock about 50%, I'll put this about 50%. In this instance, I've got a 12 inch deep container, but if you look here, I'm only filling it up with about nine inches, it's about eh, probably 10 inches. So I've got about five inches of lava rock and five inches of this. Five inches of this is plenty for planting. When you plant into this, I should have saved one of these plants to plant for you here. You just basically wiggle your plant down in, throw a little bit of this around it, and boom, you're planted. I mean, that's why I love it so much. And uh, we got some basic plants in here, just kind of getting started out. These are plants that kind of got abused in other places and they, they needed a home and, and I'm slowly beginning to plant this out. They're sacrificial. Uh, the system might not be completely ready yet. So, um, We'll see how they do. They're kind of like our test case. If they if they look healthy, we'll, we'll keep adding plants. If not, we'll keep adding nutrient, fish, et cetera, until we get this balanced. And uh, really this whole system's starting to come together. I don't know that I need more grow bed, but I could easily put a second row of grow beds right over here. So you'd wanna leave enough space in between that you could comfortably work both sides. So about right here. You could have a second row of these. That'd be six of those. That's probably more, you could grow more food in six of those. You know, as far as vegetables, and I think the average family of, of, of two to four would even consider eating. Uh, especially if you grow the things that are best suited to aquaponics. You won't, you know, I got a pepper plant there and tomato plant. Tomatoes do really good. Peppers, nee, like I do grow so well with peppers in the ground. That's what I do more uh, than anything else. But, you know, celery, parsley, that's a Chinese white celery plant there. That's, I've never grown that before. So we got to do, that's a, that's a parsley, that's a shard. Swiss chard does great. Uh, a lot of root crops actually do really well. Uh, garlic grows great in these. Um, green onions are fantastic. Every time I, you know, if I do buy green onions, I cut the tips off and I put them in there. Usually what we do when I have to buy green onions, which isn't very often, but when I'm like resupplying, I buy way more onions than I need. I just cut the very top, so they just cut them back a couple inches so they're really long still and store them in the ebb and flow bed. And whenever you need green onions, instead of picking the green onion, you cut it off and it grows back. And if you if you go in with a whole green onion from the store first and let it get some establishment before you start cutting it, you can cut it for a year, year and a half before it'll kind of go to seed and you need to replace it. Um, there's just a ton that you can grow really well with aquaponics, but what grows best are gonna be, believe it or not, a lot of the root crops. Uh, sweet potato does great, but I don't like growing sweet potato in these. And the reason is it completely takes over and it is kind of a nightmare at harvest time. You pretty much have to rip half of everything out, harvest all your sweet potatoes, kind of sift it and put it back in because the, the hair roots go nuts 
with sweet potato in a system like this. But ginger and turmeric are some high dollar crops you can grow with these. Uh, growing ginger to baby ginger size to where it's just about to start covering over with that thick skin. That's a beautiful thing to do with these lemongrasses. High dollar stuff is what makes a lot of sense in these and salad greens. And again, tomatoes and cucumbers love ebb and flow beds. But this system, I mean, I'm not doing it, but we could be running uh, floating uh, aquaponics here, like rafts in here and do rafting in deep water rafting in these really, really easy up in these tanks. Um, I, I think that the crayfish living in here might actually eat a lot of the roots, but that wouldn't be that big of a deal. I grow so many greens so many places. I just don't really need it. So what I'm growing in here is this plant. This is a Zola. This is a fern. It's actually, it is a fern, like a fern that grows in the forest, but it's a, an aquatic floating fern. It's actually quite beautiful and it's a nitrogen fixer. So it literally fixes nitrogen on its root system and ducks and chickens eat it. And it's fairly high in protein. I believe it's in the mid to high 20s with protein. It's not as high as duckweed or water hyacinth, uh, but it's a different plant. It makes an incredible high nitrogen mulch and fertilizer. It makes great compost and it makes great feed. And I started out with a, you know, a handful of it in here about that big about two weeks ago. And that maybe maybe two of those. And this is how much it's made in two weeks because it's living on the duck waste stream that's coming into here. And then this is doing really well over here. Water hyacinth in here. I've got uh, mosquito fish throughout the whole system. There are little fish called Grambrusia. So if you're worried about mosquitoes, all that is is food for minnows and the minnows are food for everything else. Uh, but this is another great plant. This is water hyacinth. Ducks eat it, chickens eat it, goats eat it, cows, pretty much everything eats it. The dried leaf is 35% protein. That's a big part of why this system was built. In fact, it's what inspired the whole thing. Um, I'm really not looking to grow it up in these tanks. I'm just seeing how it does up here. Mostly I wanna grow that down here. Um, I've got some ornamentals in here. I've got some water irises. By the way, you know what a water iris is? It's, a, it's an iris that you grow as an emergent aquatic plant. All the irises you see in bins and stuff at the store, I would get them growing first before you do that, but you put them in a pot, some holes in the bottom, stick them in a pond, they grow and they're beautiful. Um, I've got some dwarf cattail here. This will be great for fish habitat. There's a few goldfish in here. Again, there's a lot of the gambrusia, uh, mosquito fish. But this whole system is, I'm, I'm taking my time. I was gonna go faster and I'm beginning to slow it down a little bit. I, I, I'm working with rooting some Cornelian cherry dogwood trees and they're a nice little tree. They don't get very big, you know. They grow five foot. You can keep them compact only a couple feet wide. And I'm thinking, you know, that overflow we're going to basically dig a, a really shallow trench because shallow is all we can do that runs out of here. It'll look like a dry stream bed. I have tons of that crappy rock and we can just kind of line that stream bed with that rock. And I have a bunch of remnant of the pond liner and all I need is a thin strip about two feet wide. And that's going to go to a series of swales down here. And then we can just overflow this pond anytime we want to. We can overflow it, you know, if it's close to the top like it is right now. We can overflow it just by dumping the duck wastewater into it, or we can do that whenever we want to increase the fertility in this pond, right? This isn't drinking water. This is this is a, a, a low flow duck septic system, basically is what it is. They're only up in that, that duck bath. First of all, I have to fill it for them. Second of all, I have to choose to dump it here because I can dump it other places. So I may be dumping it here once a week right now. We'll see how that goes. I can always increase or decrease that. So that can overflow. But the easiest thing to do it's just simply throw a garden hose in here on a timer, set that timer to like 20 minutes, and that's gonna overflow this. That overflows all this high nutrient water down in to these, this creek bed that we'll put in. It'll look really cool, and then we'll have some swales. And I was thinking just basically one, two, three, four trees more ornamental. What I'm thinking now is we could come in here, and my first contour might be that right there. That contour actually extends all the way over here. So my first contour would kind of run like this, and this is just to be a small swale. And I could have a whole row of Cornelian cherries. It took a long time for them to adapt to my climate, but when I figured out what they wanted, um, I've got Cornelian cherries setting this year. So it's a dogwood that produces a fruit that they call a Cornelian cherry. It's a really, really neat plant and a very compact tree that's more like a, a upright bush. So I could have a row of those in here, then come down, you know, and do more of my ornamental stuff. Or maybe I was even thinking, doing a row right here of something like white mulberry, which is a great fodder plant to feed animals and livestock, plus it produces mulberries, 
or something else. And then I, I mean, I have all this space. So we could come in and put some ornamental and productive trees, maybe a pecan in a system down there. And then the big thing I'm going to want to do is I don't want to design access out of here. You can see I got through here and mowed this. And some other things I did with this area uh, previously that didn't work out as well uh, made mowing difficult. So I want to make sure that it's going to be easy to mow between the swales and maintain this. The system really won't be grazed. I can't have the ducks in here frequently. You know, maybe they get to go in there and, and mess things up once every six months. Um, so they're they're excluded from this pasture. So that is an opportunity then in with these trees to do things like comfrey and things like that that I can't grow on that other side of that fence because they eat it. But if you look at this area, I won't even maximize production here because I just don't need to. And I want to keep a lot of it open because I think this is going to be a beautiful place for people to camp when we do workshops. Just a gorgeous place for people to camp. But this is not that big of an area. This is an area that most people... If you're looking for land, you can get an area this big. I'm going to say that, like, from this fence over to that clump of trees is, it's 35 yards. My, my, my archery hunting eye tells me that's about 35 yards. I'd be using my third pin on a deer's shoulder over there. And then you're looking at ah, 50 yards up to that, not even 50, 40, 45 yards, right? So, I mean, you're looking at 30 by 40 yards, call it. Um, guys, that's a lot of suburban backyards. And if you can get a little bit of fall in it like this, this system, man, could feed, it could feed a family easily. Let's think about some things you can do that maybe I can't do here, or you would do that I'm not going to do here. First of all, if you wanted this to look prettier, all of that could be facaded in some fence pickets and things like that. Once that was all dressed in, it would just look gorgeous. I'm thinking about putting a little trellis up over the top of it so I can train things vertically. You could have two of those. That could all be trellised in. Um, you could, if you were doing this system for you, and I have other systems, if you only had one system, you could be growing all of your bait stock, your minnows, your shrimps, etc., up in these tanks, right? Crayfish, whatever. And you could be keeping fish down here that you actually eat. I'm keeping goldfish in here. I'm keeping this a non-predator based system because of what I'm doing with it. And because I have predator systems over there and I'm able to grow stock here to feed those guys there. But if you were doing something differently, you could modify that to where you've got your, you've got your, your bait stock, your feed stock up here. And you've got your, like, let's say catfish or bluegills down here. And this is only about 20 inches deep because I have a rock shelf. Most of you don't. Well, look at the dimensions of this thing. This is 8 by 16 feet, and this is beautiful looking. I would have been really happy if I could have gone deeper to knock one 4x4 out of this and had your top rail down here and actually lowered it even a little bit more. Or even at these dimensions, you could come up one more layer, depending on the height you want, and put a wide cap rail on it, okay? And then you've got a place to sit. But the lower you go, if you're going to include poultry like, like you know, water, water poultry like ducks or geeses, you know, you need a place to create that flow. Now you're dropping nutrient in it. But if you don't have a rock shelf, you could be this lower, lower, and you could easily go three foot down. I mean, we had an excavator here. If, if this would have been dirt, we could have dug a three foot square here. God, we could have done that in 15, 20 minutes, uh, maybe not dirty to make it look pretty and do it right. And then you'd have four foot of water but you'd only have this much height. And when you're doing aquaponics, you want your bottom system, your sump, and this is acting as a giant sump for the system. You want it as low as possible because that makes your places you're moving water up to as low as possible because, trust me, because I've done it in situations where I've had to, you don't want an ebb and flow bed up here where you're trying to work on it like this and you need a ladder to pick a tomato that's you know 20 feet in the air. But this is, uh, this is turning into something completely different. It's, it, it started out with one simple idea, and it was all in this plant. It was all in this high-protein plant that does so many things that the government hates it. But this plant makes livestock feed. This plant makes fertility and compost. This plant even makes ethanol, and this plant is even edible by humans. And the idea of growing this off a duck waste stream is what led to this. And I, I think it's kind of a new chapter in the world of aquaponics. And I'm excited to see where it goes. And you guys get to come along with me for the journey. And uh, as we continue to improve it, we'll keep going. Because now what we're doing is we're using aquaponic systems 
to feed into terrestrial systems and specifically perennial terrestrial systems, it's uh, something a little different. Check it out, guys, and uh, we'll be back with you later.